Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Natalia Martin, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to talk about industry-specific 62443 insights uh, for power generation. Our panelist is uh, Jesus Molina, who is the Director of Industrial Security here at Waterfall, and he'll share his perspective on 62443 uh, seen through the lens of power generation. A uh, couple of notes before we start. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and uh, like always, you will all re receive an email with the link to the recording um, in the coming days. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, please submit your questions uh, in the Q&A panel uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, at any time during the session. We will try to answer all of your questions, uh, but in case we're out of time, uh, we'll make sure we'll reach out to you individually uh, via email. Also, uh, if you'd like to talk to one of our experts separately on this topic, or if you have any questions about our products, uh, I'll share a link uh, in a Q&A panel for your convenience, uh, so you can contact us directly. And with that, Jesus, the stage is yours. Well, thank you, Natalia, for this uh, kind introduction. As Natalia said, my name is Jesus Molina. I am the director of uh, industrial security at Waterfall Security. But also, I am a lecturer at the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya, uh, where I teach uh, the Masters of uh, Master of Rail Service Security, which is basically me teaching IC 6443 using um, Senelec uh, TS50701, uh, which is um, a way to transpose or like to mediate between 6443 and uh, rail networks. So this is what uh, prompted me to, to do this webinar. So with that, let's just start the webinar. I think uh, people have uh, time to join. Today, we're going to talk about industry specific 62443 insights for power generation. I understand uh, this is going to be a little bit of a, a niche of a niche. Um, also the right, Name is ISA IC 6443. I will use 6443 for now, just for brevity and uh, for people not to to go crazy. Um, so uh, this uh, webinar is sponsored Waterfall Security. Uh, we're across the world, and um, I uh, we work obviously with uh, power generation uh, in many sites, all types of power generation. So we have been um, working with clients with has necessities of 6043. And also I have myself um, have to teach 6043 and understand, understood what a little bit, uh, what entails in order to, to focus on a specific vertical. Um, to have a little bit of a, a structure and a quick note, this webinar is heavily based on an ebook I wrote or I have, I have written. Uh, now it's in the editing room. So it will be released soon, uh, maybe in a week. And it will contain much more details. Uh, this is obviously a very complex subject and has a lot of details on it. So uh, when this webinar ends, you know, if you want a copy, probably you will get one in about a week, which will focus on on exactly what I have described today. Today, I will focus on the basics, which is first the standards, the structure, and how to certify against them. Uh, I want to start with this just because to have a little bit of an introduction. I know out of you are probably pros in uh, 62443, but still it's good to have a little bit of background. And trust me, sometimes you get a little bit uh, new things from that. Then I will talk about the unique needs of uh, power generation and why it's necessary to just kind of mediate between 6443 and um, the implementation for power generation. Then I will talk of one of the first things which I think is necessary, which is a little bit um, not discussed in 6443, which is a consequence-based risk assessments. Then um, some templates uh, for zones and conduits. Again, uh, in 6443, there are not templates for specifically power generation. And then 
one important thing is SL1 to SL4 is uh, really cumbersome to implement and uh, we need to simplify. And uh, one of the things we can do is uh, to provide engineering related controls. And I will discuss about it, okay? So let's start a little bit with the inspiration for this. So I, I have been teaching this course on real side security and I was blown away uh, uh, with one document, which is uh, TS50701. Uh, this document has been created by the rail industry, rail industry expert, and now is headed by, I think, Serge Benolier. And uh, it is one of the greatest documents I've heard, I I've read uh, that um, evaluates the standard and tries to implement it in the industry. While um, teaching this document to uh, rail engineers, basically, um, I thought that uh, it would be great to have a document like this for other industries. So I am not making any any kind of, um, uh, uh, like uh, saying like out of the things I have uh, in this um, presentation are taken or or, or basically insp inspired uh, by uh, this document. Um, some of them are not, so I will tell which ones are more mine and ones are coming more from this document. This document contains a lot of things that I have been missing uh, when doing power generation. Uh, asset model, you see here in the upper uh, part, um, very structured templates uh, for zones and conduits, which you see in the right. Uh, connectivity matrix matrices, uh, which uh, basically tell you what conduit should you use and, and how you should use it, um, and more stricter um, zoning templates, you know, which you will see there, like this Z zone uh, criticality and zoning based on criticality. So I try to, again, take out the inspiration on this and try to um, uh, do the same for power generation. So this webinar comes because power generation does not have similar materials as ps five zero seven zero one. hopefully there will be one uh, soon or whenever the industry decides so. There is a standards focus on cyber security, on power generation, and people are working very hard in these standards and they are good, but they do not touch the link 6243. It's more about communication protocols. This is 62351. So this webinar addresses these needs, uh, you know, applications uh, for power generation sector specifically, simplify the standards and maximize the benefits uh, and reducing complexity. Why 643 is uh, not enough? Uh, first, it's horizontal, which is beautiful, you know, like that way we can apply it for all OT industries. However, also means that there is a lot of choices and that comes, um, what comes to seem to be a choice creep and complexity, you know, you have so many choices, so many templates, so many things, uh, so many risk assessments that you have to. So at the end, you end up spending a lot of time uh, in this and also, they're aging documents, meaning that, um, for example, 62443 3-2, which is what we're going to mostly discuss today, uh, was last published in 2020. And there is a reason for that. I mean, I am part of the committees of, uh, well, part of the committees, part of the committee that is now working on 3-2. And um, there is many people in the room, there is many people that want their voice to be heard. Um, consensus needs to be reached in order to have the standards passed and voted. So at the end of the day, um, this um, takes time, you know, and it's understandable. However, we have seen here at Waterfall that uh, the risk that happened in 2020 or was evaluated at 2020 doesn't really match the risk we have today. Today we have physical consequences and you can see there, we have evaluated that uh, for the last um, 20, uh, 20 years uh, in our uh, risk, uh, our third reports. So before 2020, there were like 20 attacks with physical consequences. After 2020, there have been hundreds of attacks with physical consequences. This modifies the risk in a way where like power generation in particular needs to be aware. So the documents in particular 6043 3-3 that was released in 2013 or something like that, the controls they have, they're mostly software controls and may not reflect what we need to put in power generation today. What to do about that, you know? So first is to understand that what we have to try to do is simplify. And for doing that, we need to start with a consequence-based risk assessment. And um, there has been a lot of literature on it, and I will discuss that. 
we have to have templates uh, for sensors and conduits, including the con connectivity matrices that you saw there, like uh, were appearing in TS50701. And then also we have to understand what are engineering controls and why they are important. Uh, and they're important um, because you cannot reach uh, SL4, for example, and we'll discuss what SL4, security level four means uh, for the whole power generation plant. So you really need to be uh, much more practical when it comes to assessments and what kind of controls they're going to put in a power generation plant. Now, let's understand first what they are, if you are new to 6243 farming of the standards, there are basically four uh, parts. One is the general part, then is the policy and position part, there's the system part and the component part. And lately there has a five, fifth part, uh, which is about implementing the the, the four, um, but anyway, let's focus on what, what we see here. And um, one thing that's important to see here is that um, you may have seen this diagram before and you have seen many more documents and uh, I have reduced this because this is the one documents that are available uh, to buy in the ISA or IEC sites. Also, the green thing to see there is the actual standards. The other ones are technical requirements and technical specifications. Technical requirements are the lower level, technical specifications are very close to be part of the standard, and then there are the standards. You can see there also the times these things have been released. You may notice this uh, 6243-1.5, um, which is uh, security profiles, which are trying to do what I am discussing here, which is great. However, first, they were kind of controversial, so has not been ratified as standard, still a technical specification. And also, no security profile has been released. And if it's released, I assume it will be very focused on a particular thing, for example, a substation or something like that. You know, So I, I assume that uh, will be the focus or a pipeline or something. Not in a whole like uh, industry, like power generation, oil and gas. You know, It will be much more uh, focused. Now, um, what we're going to focus today is in 6243-3-2, which is the risk assessment, um, because it's what uh, most people use. First, they do risk assessment, then do profiling, and then they do the zoning. So that's what we are going to discuss. What we, I think, we need to try to avoid implementing really fast is 3-3. And 3 is the problem is that is 2013, it was released. The controls, it says there, um, it says there is complicated to assume and people are very fluent with security level one to four. But the truth is when it comes to systems, and I will discuss this in a second, uh, it gets complicated because people always think when they see the standards, they see, hey, how can I get certified? And that's kind of the elephant in the room. Before we go into certification, I'll describe a little bit security levels, also to understand the problematic we're having here. So security levels go to one and four, but security level one, which is even quite difficult to achieve when it comes to certificate components, you know, with not a system, but a component. Um, before we go back to this, let me go back. When you see there like a, a component in the bottom, um, these are uh, standards that try to evaluate a component, not a system, you know, so these are the parts of the standard that usually uh, are certified. So it's 4-1 and 4-2. So when you are certifying something or evaluating something um, against uh, uh, 6243, people always think about security levels, which are SL1, SL2, SL3, and SL4. SL1 is the lowest, which is only against casual or coincidental violation. So nobody's trying to do anything wrong to you but uh, they may find a password by mistake and use it. Well, SL4 is protecting against, you know, like um, uh, state-based attacks, so very skillful adversaries. Now, SL4 is extremely difficult to achieve at the component level and at the system level. However, like even if you achieve SL1, which is actually quite difficult to achieve even at component level for the certification, that means that you only achieve resistance against very, minor attacks, right? Also, these attacks that we're talking about are more probabilistic when we do these likelihood matrices. Um, but today, you know, there are consequences, you know, like of what happens. So maybe these kind of matrices are not that easy to use. And that's what they will discuss. 
Now, for certification that got the standards, uh, people are a little bit confused about what can be certified and what cannot. What usually is certified is for like the component, the PLC, for example, right? 4-1, you can certify it against the process to create that PLC. So basically, you are certifying against that the company have maturity enough to create a product that is secure. So it will be 4-1. The other certification you can have is 4-2. First, you have to have 4-1. So your company now is mature enough to create a secure product. Then you do 4-2, which is, well, now that we know that you are mature enough to create this product, then let's certify this product so to see what can resist in terms of attacks? And can be SL1, SL2, SL3, SL4. It's a difficult process and achieving things like SL3 is really difficult. SL4 is very, very difficult. So, but even then, this will say that that component can resist like uh, attacks against certain adversaries, but they will not say anything about the system itself. So you can have a component that is SL3, SL4, and then, you know, the zone or like the, the system itself be SO1 because other, other, other systems can be attacked. Sometimes can be certified again 3-X, you know, 3-1, 3-2. -3 but that's usually when you have a, things like substations, right? You know, which are systems of systems, you know? So that way you say, well, I got to certify my substation. So, but you do it as a component almost, you know? Um, but certifying a whole system uh, against uh, an institution that your system achieves SO4, doesn't exist. It's more an internal evaluation. Obviously, you can have it very structured and very well. But just understand that, you know, certifying a component against 4-1 or 4-2 doesn't mean that that component is going to provide the whole thing uh, in a higher security level. That will provide with controls like intrusion detection systems or firewalls and external gateways. The process it's um, to do 6243 3-2 is uh, quite complex and I will not go over it. More or less is like you have a system under consideration, maybe in this case, a power generation plant. You prefer an initial risk assessment. Then you partition the system under consideration in zones and what is connecting between them which is called conduits. And then you see, is the risk tolerable? And if not, then you do another assessment for every zone, which is much more in depth. And then you assign security levels for what we call the foundational requirements. I will not go in detail on that because it's quite complex, but it's actually a vector, if not a number. It's like 0, 1, 0, 1, depending on different things. So if you do the detailed assessment, you will see, as I see here, you do the SLT, which is this vector. And again, it is a very, very involved process. So what we are trying to avoid here, actually, is to go to that level of detail when it comes to uh, power generation. What we want is to strike down as much as possible uh, things that uh, we cannot tolerate before arriving to the detailed uh, risk assessment. And how do we do that? We do that by being practical. So what we do first and, um, is to have an engineering-focused cybersecurity program. What we want to do is to move more to engineering, uh, more than to IT, more to engineering, because IT will always provide us with IT solutions that will last a certain time, will not be some consequences, but in the likelihood of an event, because that's what IT people do, right? But not engineers. Engineers try to have a stable, Thing, you know, so something that always works. Then we have an asset model. And this is important to understand your assets, to understand the level of typicality of your assets. This is very important. So this is like two key steps because that will make it so much easier to go um, after the next steps, right? And this is all consistent with 6243. I'm not adding anything new. I'm just actually really refining or, 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 or limiting the things we do inside 6243. Then instead of like a normal risk assessment, do a consequence-based risk assessment, which is totally valid also. C243 also says you can do this kind of consequence-based risk assessment. After that, you do the zones and conduits. You eliminate all unacceptable events. Try to eliminate them. And then if you, know, you go to the next step, you eliminate all the events that you don't want, 
you apply power models such as NERC-SIP that you have to apply anyway. You know, you just have to apply all these things. Check all the boxes. And then after that, if you believe that there is still risk, then you do the detailed risk assessment on the zones that you believe still there is something that uh, is not tolerable for you. But as you see, if we do this thing, when we arrive to the detailed risk assessment, we will have to strike down a lot of things already. You know, our risk will have diminished greatly. So we are being practical. We're trying to make things easier uh, when it comes to apply c three. I have talked with many people, uh, many friends that try to apply c three in their plants, and they always say it's such a difficult process, uh, involves like uh, many things, and at the end of the day, you take shortcuts. With this, you try to take shortcuts, not taking shortcuts, it's just like uh, doing it right at the beginning or trying to, to, to work on what is important at the beginning. So after that, it doesn't become cluttered. Now, again, going back, what are we going to try to do here that is um, you know, more focused on, on power generation is these three things. So we'll start for the first thing, which is uh, what is a consequence-based risk assessment? So we had our asset model. Uh, so first we start with an asset model. And this is an asset model that is consequential, meaning that what are the things that can happen with these assets? Are these business assets? Are they control assets that may affect reliability or are safety assets? So you talk with the engineers, obviously you know what IT assets are, but today like power generation plants are becoming more complex. There are cloud systems, the IoT systems. So we need to understand in this first stage this asset model. This is a asset model I created myself. I didn't find any, um, but uh, this is important for us to start to have these kind of resources where we know what assets exist in a power plant, defining clearly, and then say what kind of uh, criticality they have, because this will help us doing zoning afterwards. Right now, I don't see, it's not very clear for me when I read 6443, uh, how to go from, from this to that, you know? and. Um, I think TS phase 0701 is very good at that. And I think we should be better at that when it goes to power generation. When we have our um, typical likelihood versus impact, we drop the likelihood. This is because it doesn't really matter the likelihood today. I mean, today you can have a SL1, but then tomorrow you can have a new enemy. And then this enemy may be a nation state. And then you will have to have SL4. So how do you do that? You have to refine all your controls. It's better to focus on the impact, something that we can actually look at and talk with the engineers. What is the impact of this happening, you know, and be realistic about it. It doesn't matter how low today this likelihood is because the attackers may have new tools, uh, there may be a new vulnerability. So we need to focus on the impact. And there are a lot of uh, new frameworks that can help us focus on the impact. That is cyber inform engineering, that is the uh, consequence-driven cyber form engineering, or CCE. There is the CDBT, or still the same base threat. And there is the uh, SPR, or Secure Process Hazard Analysis Review. All these can be more streamlined, uh, more comprehensive. I put a little bit of a matrix there to understand. But you have tools and mechanisms to do what I'm telling you. This is, has been worked for the last five years. People understand that that's the way we have to go, is to first go into a consequence base, forget the probability, Focus on the consequences first. So I think most of you, I mean, if you have been in our webinars, are familiar with most of this. Um, today, I will discuss a little bit about CDBT. Um, and later, I will talk about civil informed engineering when I'll talk about the engineering controls we can have. But in general, um, the more comprehensive uh, or more streamlined you have, you know, it's like uh, it depends on what level you want to start. I think CDBT is very easy to start. You know, you start with a set of things or threats that you believe that create consequences that you cannot afford. For example, you can start with a scenarios like the business cell design, physical processes, automation systems, and networks such as node internet-based attack pivoting through intermediate networks and systems can reach safety critical nor reliability critical networks. What that means, that no attack from the internet can create a safety problem or a reality problem. That's specific, you know. Does your system today 100% will allow you to do that? Yes or no? And not 
a probability of like it's a 10 percent i have sl4 so maybe a national stand can achieve it just say yes with a very 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 high credibility or no so you create these items another can be for example uh, nobody can rewrite the logs of a safety system process or whatever so for that for example you know you have to say well can people read the logs today? Are in non-writable media? Are backed up in a place where it's not reachable for an attacker? So then you have this um, with the, this like the the, DB, the 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 same base thread. You know, you make a line and everything below you actually can. You know, you 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 have to strike it down, and the other ones you have to work on it. You have to provide engineering things to avoid the consequence. This can be you know like uh, avoiding, for example, the generator to to raise to a certain level or or things like that you know so you create this very very simple uh, set of items that you know are consequences that you know that will not happen another one is the secure PHA review which i really like however this is much more per item right you know you go through each item you have for example this plc what does this plc do can this plc if it hacked um, create uh, a safety incident, and if the answer is yes, means that you have to do something about it. You know, you have to create an engineering control that prevents this uh, PLC where it be hacked to create a safety incident. That can be like, you know, putting a relay there that avoids it to increase the power to a certain level, things like that. So, and you are very precise about it. You know, you go through all the items, talk with engineering. It is a very interesting process, but it's the opposite as to what I talk about the CDBT. The one is more for from above, you know, this is one from the engineering side, you know, you start very, very low level component to component. But as I say, there is ways to do this consequence based um, as, a, a assessments, you know, and it works much better because now you have a way to say, okay, so I know what systems are critical and what systems are not. Now I can do a zoning that is more based on obviously things like where are the location of the assets and the wires and et cetera, which is the what system for three proposes. But you can go further, you know, you can say, well, now criticality is also important, right? So we have again our uh, asset model. Now we can look at this green, yellow, and start building a template, you know, of what are the different the different uh, zones and these zones are based on criticality today when we do, we do this we usually look at the 4d model which is, is, is beautiful and it's great you know it has been used forever you know it's the layer cake you see always you know which is level zero level one level two level three level four however you know is this something that polygon can use it has been very usable because unlike rail, you know, that is much different because it's much spread and it's much more complicated to use a Terra model, uh, the Purdue model. In uh, generation, prior generation has been structured that way a little bit, you know, you have the power plants, you know, with the controls and the systems, what we see here at the bottom, the plant operations, that level one, level two, then we have, got, have the serpent infrastructure that can be level three, right, you know, and then we have the business network that's level four, so this work has worked pretty well, but there are things breaking this model, the cloud systems, the IoT systems that may not be safety systems, but still they sense things and send it to the cloud. So it's better and more, uh, more precise to divide these, uh, these different uh, uh, zones with templates that are talking about the criticality of these, of these zones. Uh, and I'm taking this straight from, from TS50701. I didn't create these CZ5S. These naming conventions, I'm taking it just uh, for being consistent with them, because I think it's great. You know, It's like you have level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, but they are not discussing how close you are to um, the physical level they're talking about how critical these systems are and you are not doing a one by one matching of closing to the physical then it's very important you're a little bit more precise quite more precise the next thing you want to understand is uh, okay so how do we connect these zones when i have created these templates it's um, there are two things you can use and as a conduit to connect these zones one is firewalls and one is universal technology you can discuss with me, well, there is other ways to connect. Um, you can use one wire, you can use 
But at the end of the day, in power generation, the two controls being practical that we use all the time are firewalls and electrical technology. That's it. Firewalls, we all know about it, but uh, what we may not know about it is that they are software. And they are really flexible, so they are great, but at the same time, they can be hacked. Um, they have the same problems like other systems have. Passwords um, can be hacked. They have vulnerabilities that can be um, exploited. So their policy is, is very flexible, and also the hackers can, can, can use it. And the other one we have is universal technology, which um, they are more inflexible. They can only send data one way, but they are physical. They're engineering grade controls, meaning that the cybersecurity is provided by physics, not by software. And today we have universal technologies, really. You know, we have flips that reverse direction. We have bypasses that allow you certain bidirectionality every certain time. So we have a lot of different technologies. So this thing of like cut only one way and that's it. It's more about the fact that the policy that you implement is implemented by physics, not by software. So this is extremely important on when to choose one or the other, right? You know, um, this thing is like separated. So, you know, you have a strict separation between uh, the systems. So when to use one or the other is uh, what I think it was also very interesting that was uh, discussed in PS50701 for rail. It's you create this matrix where you say, okay, can safety talk with uh, business and how, or ca how can a reality critical system talk with you know, something else? And you create a matrix with either say, no, this cannot be, never be connected, um, can use a firewall or has to use an actual gateway. This is really important because it makes us be much more consistent when we implement our defenses. Again, conduits are only two, you know, firewalls, and you can put firewalls everywhere and you can get away with it. However, universal gateways, for example, are much better when you um, have systems with different criticality. Once you have this, this is an example for a power generation plant, obviously simplified. I'm talking about generation unit here. So you have divided using your asset model, and that's what else is missing for 643 is this, okay, now we have asset model. We have the criticality. Now we have a template with the different criticality our systems can have. I have a consequence-based assessment which says, I cannot um, in this system have, for example, attacks that come from business. So you implement an actual gateway from OT to IT can send data in only one direction, replicates the information to business. Now, you know for certain with 100% probability that no attacks from business can traverse all the way to safety just because there is an engineering green solution that prevents that. So you can strike that down as a consequence. You don't have to implement, for example, a security level four uh, for the third party infrastructure now. I mean, you still have to implement certain level depending on the risk, but you understand that that particular thing you don't have to care that much about. If you put a firewall there, then you have to understand that this is not a strike down. It can, it can happen. So you need to start implementing security compensatory measures in the third party infrastructure, basically defining controls and systems inside that plan infrastructure that raise your security level against possible attacks, again, SO3 or SO4 or whatever enemy you want to defeat. And that look at uh, zones as critical systems, at critical levels, you know, like you have like certain critical four, so critical three will help you to understand, for example, that IoT sensors, even they are like very close in the port view level zero two, they can use a firewall to connect to the cloud. I mean, you don't have any problem as long as they are detached from, for example, the turbines. If you have a sensors that uh, look at um, uh, the vibration, you can safely send them directly to the cloud. Now we go to applying engineering controls. So we have this, you know, we now have all this uh, we have seen. And uh, I discussed before that, you know, if you, for example, find out that you need to have uh, your safety systems preventing certain things, you know, like you have to have SL4 to all your safety systems. And achieving that may be extremely difficult and cumbersome. And specifying why do you didn't achieve SL4 can be excruciating. 
it's better to do it from the start. Say, well, I don't have to achieve SL4 in a safety system because I use an XL gateway to send information. I use um, logs that are non-writable to put like the information. So there's no way an attacker, even in like uh, internal attackers, to modify these logs. And then you put engineering controls, you know, with a SPH review, SPL review, for example, where like even if somebody is able to internally plug a USB drive into my safety system, still it will not be able to whatever because I have an engineering stop there that prevents it to do more damage, you know? So this is what an engineering control is. It's something that it is not a software control, it's not a probability, it's a certainty that this evil consequence you're trying to prevent is not going to happen. So what are they? So in engineering, we're not looking at probabilities in a way where we're looking at probabilities today in, in, in cybersecurity. Probabilities are where we challenge. And I know that because I ask my students to do risk assessments for a train and all of them provide me a different thing. You know, they will one side like, well, was, this is a lot of risk. And they will say, well, there is no risk because I know how this is implemented. Or there is no risk because I don't know nobody is going to ever attack that thing or trying to speed up the train. I mean, it's, it is a little bit of whatever believes on the likelihood it is. Well, when you build a bridge, you are not thinking about that, you know? Uh, you are thinking about, okay, I put the bridge, so I'm certain that even a million people go through the bridge, it will not go down, right? This is important to make that difference, right? So we need to trust 100% or like with a very, 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 very big reliability what we are implementing. And that's what you want, you know, to have set that way more certain. A book uh, released by Andrew Ginter discusses a little bit what we discuss about network engineering, which is using unidirectional gateways to avoid or to put it in critical boundaries like the OTIT interfaces in different dispositions. You can have a flip, you can have uh, systems that reverse. And we discuss, I discussed this uh, before, so I will not go over it. And it's a good book. Many of you probably have it. Andrew is a, a great uh, writer, and this is uh, very important. So this is a type of uh, negative control that allows you to have a little bit more, uh, like, uh, not to be so strict when you go with, to the to the advanced risk assessment. No, to be much more uh, understand that certain things that you are avoiding the consequence will not happen. But there are others. Um, there are like ones based on physics, which is the ones that for sure, you know, is based on physics. That would be, you know, offline backups, analog, analog sign, signaling, uh, right ones read many. So there are some of these controls that are physics, you know, you cannot really send information because you have analog signaling or you have offline backups. So, I mean, there is nothing uh, people can do online to, to, to tamper with them. There are others that are hardware that are a level up of software. So still you can hide, find flaws in hardware. You can find things, you know, that, uh, you know, or even physically you can tamper with them, but they provide a bigger level of security. For example, authentication, you can use uh, trusted platform modules or TPMs. I was part of, of these committees in the past. And that will obviously uh, be more close to engineering grade because you have a much more certainty that an attacker, in the case of uh, they provide a cyber attack, they will not, um, you know, control your authentication tokens, for example, you know, because they are stored in TPMs. So as you can see, there is like three levels almost. So you can put of uh, levels of how close we are to engineering and how close we are to IT. We have flexible controls, which are IT controls. And these are intrusion detection systems. These are uh, uh, like uh, antiviruses. Uh, they are, you know, uh, authentication methods. You know, all these are software controls that are implemented in software, and uh, they have their place. But this will be implemented after the two previous ones, which are the hardware controls and the physical controls. These two are either the physical controls can produce the attack like universal gateways do, they prevent at, like information to come in, physics, you cannot do nothing about it, or systems that prevent the consequence to happen. You can have 
relays. You know, what if the voltage increases, it goes down. So you put more relays. If you see that a PLC can be hacked and can create this damage, then you say, well, maybe a key here we need one more relay. So this is physics. Like this is certain. This is engineering grade. Then there is hardware, which is closer to engineering, but a little bit more closer to software, right? At the end, you have software controls. So I want to discuss a little bit what I have talked here and how can be applied specifically uh, to power generation and what can wh where we go from here. First, again, this is based on an ebook I wrote, and um, I have been much more precise and described more much more cases of uh, how do you do a CBDT or how you um, uh, what kind of systems uh, you have that are engineering great. But I personally will advocate first for the creation of a, something uh, close to this uh, TS50701. Uh, if nothing exists, maybe somebody will raise their hand. It's like, oh, I know something exists. But I ask many people, uh, they say something like that doesn't exist yet, at least with the reach of uh, TS50701. That will enhance the application of service security standards in the sector. Obviously, you know, I put my soul to do this and like I think um, I'm trying to help here but this is a start like I believe that uh, much bigger like uh, consensus consensus based documents will be created for energy if you have um, the capabilities um, you should start looking at your in engineering team and trying to identify and assess uh, consequences uh, and see if these consequences can happen in your power duration plan um, look at your current risk assessment and uh, try to see all these consequences from a high level or a lower level if you want to start small with the safety systems using a SPR. But look at these consequences and say, like, can they happen or not? Uh, can we lose uh, power for more than um, 10 hours? You know, and how that could happen? And try to strike down these consequences or these attack vectors that you don't want to happen. So. If you can try to do this uh, consequence-based risk assessment, uh, starting with your uh, current risk assessments, or start from scratch, you know, I think it's it's a, it's something that everybody is advocating for. I think developing templates that uh, go away from the Pera model are really good because it will provide you flexibility. It will provide you a way to reduce even um, your uh, your 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 problems you have to try to achieve certain levels of uh, SL or whatever. By, by being much, much more 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 uh, more strict, you know, you have a communication matrix. Here this will be a firewall, inertial gateway. This will not be connected to this zone, you know. And then if this cannot happen, then you rezone and then put another criticality and move things around. This is very helpful, and uh, people in rail, uh, I think, uh, are really liking this approach. Uh, I think power generation will benefit from that too. And finally, like uh, engineering upgrades uh, is something that people don't like because they love the flexibility of, of IT systems in OT systems. But honestly, in today's world, with the level of risk we are facing, I think it's uh, good to start looking at the worst case scenario, meaning that what are the consequences we don't want to avoid? I don't care about the likelihood. I want these consequences, consequences to be struck down, out, you know? And I put a relay, I put a valve that's uh, over pressure valve. I uh, put an actual gateway. I do something about this that I am certain that this consequence will not happen. If you want, um, I mean, LinkedIn, we can start discussing uh, about this. I am going to uh, talk about creating these documents in the next conference, S4 in, in February. The, I think uh, the biggest, best conference we have in OT. So I will actually open, um, like I have a, a talk about uh, having this type of of, uh, of documents uh, for every um, you know generation and see what happens in my my course in Rail. So I would like to start this uh, this forum. If you want, I mean LinkedIn, and we can talk. And if you want a consultation with Waterfall about our products or with me. Uh, please drop me an email uh, Jesus, uh, at uh, waterfallsecurity.com. And with that, you know, um, I uh, can open up to, uh, for a QA. and I'll give back to uh, Natalia for uh, starting any questions uh, you may have had. I see quite a bit. Uh, so Natalia. Yes, uh, thank you, Jesus, for 
uh, great and very informative presentation, like always. Um, first of all, we received a lot of uh, requests for your upcoming ebook, so we'll make sure we'll register all of you, uh, those who requested it. Um, so, first question we have is. Okay, can you provide more details on the consequence driven risk assessment approach and why it's particularly suited for power generation over a traditional risk matrix? Uh, risk matrices are hell. I mean, I say that because I have worked in this, you know, with power generation plants and I looked at how they have assessed, assessed the risk. Also, I saw my students try to do assessments on things like trains, and uh, they were all over the place. Likelihood, right now, it's impossible to assess and it's really difficult. There is all this A, B, C, D, E, and uh, level of the attacker, and like, does the tool exist? And like, I mean, there is all this, you go to 643, you see in the appendixes all these different like uh, matrices, and they don't work. I'm sorry, but um, they don't work. I did uh, security assessments for the Industrial Internet Consortium. I did do a risk assessment on this project you want to do for the Industrial IoT. And all of them could be paste matrices and like put things around, but it was more like coring for adults. Risk assessment, when you look at consequences, is much more strict. You have, is the consequence I want to avoid? How we avoid this consequence? No. And also, it's better if you match it with attack vector. You know, is this consequence from the internet possible? Yes. No, that should not be possible. Is this consequence? Some things are very difficult. For example, an internal attacker trying to just move the levers on a thing. You know, even if it's possible, I mean, you know that it's going to be caught. You know, I mean, the damage of damage can do is very little. But there are other things that, if possible, then it became becomes like a. Like a, like a liability. So if you go to a consequence-based risk assessment, you can be very, very strict, like with CCE, uh, which is uh, explicit in the cyber, cyber sabotage, uh, country in cyber sabotage book. You can be very, very, very strict, you know, go back one, all the possible consequences, uh, make a weighted matrix, what are the consequences that are more important for you to eliminate, or you can be much more like um, open with the, like, see, the cyber design basis threat, which is really easy to relate to others. Or you can be more specific to component, but going to consequences gives you a peace of mind. Likelihood can change, you know, like uh, the consequences will not. So striking down these consequences and avoiding these risk matrices and focusing on like more events that you want to avoid uh, will make your life much easier uh, while creating the 643. And it's consistent with 643. The 643 says that you can do a consequence based. Uh, risk assessment, but they don't explicitly have a template for it. So providing one, it's, it's necessary for the industry. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, next question is, are you aware of any cyber safety co-engineering method? Cyber safety co-engineering method. So um, in, um, in um, TSV 0701, uh, the rail standards, again, kudos to the team working on that. They are now working on a standard. Um, I think it's called 634, right? I don't know what it's like, uh, numbers. Uh, uh, but uh, they're working uh, on a standard. Um, uh, they're going to talk in uh, in a upcoming ENISA conference, which I'm a speaker to there in uh, October 2nd. Uh, Serge uh, Berolier uh, is going to talk about it uh, there. And they have an, a chapter where they do that. They have... Um, on one side, they have cybersecurity, and then they have safety, and they have a co-engineering of like, what is the process, you know, of, uh, of you do first this in, in safety, and then uh, you relay this into, into, into um, uh, cybersecurity. This is very important because real has uh, safety systems, which are obviously signaling systems, you know, so you need to prevent that crashes could crash, you know, and in order to do cybersecurity and safety are very related there. Um, in uh, power generation, we have similar things, you know, so um, trying to take this uh, that they have done in TS-1701 and try to do sim something similar for power generation is necessary. There is also 
ISA uh, 80 or TS, uh, the 80, like which do safety. And now they are doing a new iteration of this. Uh, I, I'm probably butchering it. But the new iteration, I am not very happy with the current results, but this is my personal opinion. Um, also, they talk about co engineering, but uh, there is ways. But I think uh, to create one for power generation that is very explicit, attached to 6443, and discusses. Uh, specifics of power uh, doesn't exist today and it should exist. Thank you. Um, one of the questions we have, uh, could you please elaborate more on IC62443-4-1 certs? Well, uh, the only thing I can say is that, um, I mean, I, I am no how difficult it is I will have like you know gone through that and um for that one uh, you are doing the SDL so where the the life cycle life, life cycle assessment so somebody comes to your uh, company and checks that you are doing I don't know things that uh, fit assessment for your system for every system every component you create you have uh, fasting you know you have all these tools that they provide to you and you have to use them or you could have them in house or create them this is for that one, you know, so the assessment will give you the maturity that you have in order to create components that are secure. Uh, for dash two is also a component, and um, and uh, what they will come is once you have for dash one, now you can check particular components you create using this SDLA against SL one, SL two, SL three, SL four. That means that. Does your PLC have passwords that are like hard coded? Then you cannot even achieve SL1, right? If you have multi factor authentication, then maybe if you have other things, um, then you can achieve SL3 or SL4. This process is very complex. Uh, it takes months, obviously. Um, it also involves um, making very hard decisions with your product. Some products, can never achieve SL4 just because how they are created. For example, some hardware products, we can achieve certain levels, just how they are defined in 3 dash 3, uh, 4 dash um, uh, 3, or whatever, like um, the 4 dash 2, I mean. So they, they cannot really achieve that because, I mean, it is not possible. I mean, it's at the end of the day, you have to understand that also this is certification for the, the component. Right. Um, if you want to achieve a certain level in the system, you say you have to put controls, and the controls uh, will help you achieve this level. And so it's different, uh, and it's not about certification. In order to see if, for example, a firewall, or regional gateway, or a IDS uh, serves its function, you cannot go to 6443. You have to go to common criteria. Common criteria will say this is a, let's say, an IDS or a firewall because they send it to me, I check the functions that they told me they will achieve and they actually do that. So great. C443 will not help you with that. 4-2 will only say how resistant is the system to an attack, but they will not tell you that it will actually serve its function or serve security function. So when people ask me, which I sell like next gateways, 4-2 will help me achieve 3-3. It's like, no. 4-2 will only tell that inexorable gateway, our inexorable gateway, is resistant to attacks. But common criteria will tell you that we are an inexorable gateway that serves the function of only sending data one way. Because somebody has checked that there is a laser, that uh, we replicate the data. So they have actually checked. But 6-4-3 will not tell you a cybersecurity product is a good cybersecurity product. This is extremely important because people confuse this all the time. Thank you. Um, next question. How would you address purchased equipment that may have hidden malware in the software that can be activated from within without external connectivity? For example, for example, a timer-based initiation. Well, we have seen what happened uh, to in uh, in Lebanon, right? You know, the like the um, this thing that like somebody remotely or at, with a timer was able to explode systems, right? How can you avoid it? And this is obviously a matter of uh, of uh, the chain, you know, the, the, the supply chain. And uh, supply chain, uh, I didn't talk about it because it's 
a wall by itself. We have the S bombs, you know, the, uh, secure bills of material, which is very in right now. And I fully um, on it. You know, I think it's it's good. It's a very complicated. As somebody that has worked in the trusted platform model, which we needed an S bomb in order to certify the system can boot, for example. And we took like in, in five years, ten years that I was working there uh, in the trusted computing group committees nobody was able to achieve that um, because you know obviously the kernel has to talk with whatever it's very difficult so to, to define a malware and like uh, this kind of supply chain like uh, how somebody has put that and most in hardware like it's in the case of these pagers i mean it's it's a it's a complicated subject and um it's something that we need a very uh, specific uh, uh, look at it uh, the european uh, union is putting regulation to do more about it and uh, i I'm addressing that, but we're in the infancy. And uh, I think with what happened in Lebanon, we see that a lot of people will start saying, you know, why somebody has put something in my software, you know, and I understand that. Uh, I think SBOM is a way to prevent that. I think, for example, with this SBOM is going to get a big push, you know, because people say, we want to know what's in our uh, software. We want to have a bill of materials. So that's the way to do that. Thank you. Um, next question. Every risk assessment utilizes a risk matrix for categorizing risk. Every risk assessment will involve identifying the consequences given a special type of value, and you can focus on critical ones by prioritizing them. So what is really the difference? What's the difference is that when you put likelihood uh, in the mix, um, you're making things easier or more difficult for you uh, as much as you want, right? I mean, likelihood is, is very depending on, on, on what you think. And at the end, the prioritization, when somebody looks at risk matrix, will come from these green things to say, okay, I'll prioritize the red over the green because the red looks very bad, very high, and the low. Obviously, you can always change that and do what I said, you know, like, I mean, actually, you can take a normal risk assessment and say, okay, I don't care about these parts, you know, and I only, I only care about the part below. So I ca you can transform uh, a risk assessment into a consequence-based risk assessment. However, it's a little bit about the look at it, you know, it's uh, it's more like starting with that. It's like, look, you know, uh, let's start with what I don't want to happen in my power generation plant. And this has not happened in the past because again, there were no physical consequences. Um, the consequences were mostly IT consequences of data being stolen from manufacturing plants. Uh, I think if C2 or 3 were starting now, they will start with that. It's like, look, we know that uh, people can put the lights out. Uh, we have seen it before. And uh, we need to start with preventing that, you know? And then we move to preventing other things like data leakage, you know? I mean, I think, People will redefine quite hard the 3 3 and make it much more strict what controls you can use and what, what is important uh, for, for power generation. But until that happens, I think it's good for us to, to, to be a step ahead and say, uh, let's focus on the things that we don't want to happen and the attack vectors that that may create that, you know, that are, are credible, right? Uh, Andrew Winter has a talk on S4 about credibility versus probability, which is, is, is really um, groundbreaking, I think. It's like, we should not talk about probability anymore. We should say, because probability, we can move it. But credibility is something that it's much, the, the, the name in itself make uh, it look better, but different. You know, probability looks like very good, uh, but it's not, right? You know, it's, uh, it's something that, um, um, uh, that uh, is moves. So token probability is the wrong uh, way of, of talking about because probability by use as, as used by engineers is actually probability. You know that probability is this probability because you have seen it a million times, you know? The probability of like a, a, a thunder coming, uh, a, a lightning bolt uh, hitting your, your, your system and uh, raising the power is a probability because you, you have track record. But when you put like 0 0.2 probability of like my PLC being hacked by the attacker, that doesn't have any meaning. It's, it's actually quantitative. You should call it credibility, right? You know, what the credibility of this to happen, you know? And you can put the score. Um, but uh, the, the naming we are using in cybersecurity for probability is, is not the right thing. That's 
really is never a probability or almost never a probability. So I think it's totally wrong. So I think uh, the talk uh, Andrew is going to give us for is, is going to be uh, an eye opener for a lot of people. Thank you, Jesus. Um, let's take one more question. We're approaching the, the top of the hour. Um, so what are your thoughts regarding the relationship between 62443 and the NIST risk management framework used by, by the US and US uh, NERC CAP standards? Well, I have a book about this, <laughs> so you can like, or I have a lot of a webinar too, so you can like do NIS2 for OT professionals, Jesus Molina, and you can hear all about my thoughts about NIS2. NIS2, um, it's a hidden gem in the sense of like, look at an IT thing, but really, if you look at what is who's affected, OT professionals should understand it and try to weaponize it for our purpose and make, uh, get some money out of it. So. Um, I think it needs to can help a lot if we make it help us and not take IT the control of NIST2. NIST2 is about consequences. Uh, Article 21, it clearly says that you have to provide security controls that uh, match the consequences that systems may have in people or things. And, um, and this is something that is consequence-based. So you have to say, what are the consequences? Should I use the same security controls uh, for a, a business system than for my power generation plants uh, by turbines? The answer is no in NIS2. It's very clear in Article 21. So I think we should try to understand Article 21, which is what is the meat of NIS2 really for us, and, uh, and weaponize it to, to, to get more services controls and engineering upgrades to our systems uh, that match the consequence. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Um, we have a few more questions, but uh, we are going to uh, reply to to those people via email. Um, do you want Jesus? Do you want to add anything? Any any last words? No, I just uh, again, I have uh, I have to take uh, a lot from TS five zero seven zero one. So thanks to them, uh, they did a great job, and they are still doing a great job trying to do the standard. Um, and I think that power generation will benefit to have uh, you have great people in power generation, and I'm sure uh, with some leadership, this uh, you know something uh, that like TS five zero seven zero one will be very very helpful for the power generation community. Okay, well, that's it for today. On behalf of Waterfall, we'd like to thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you for Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good day.